Hello, everyone, and welcome to the press conference for Root Irish, which world premiered in Cannes yesterday. And uh, two entirely different sort of planets of panelists here uh, today. One is a well-known actor on television, and surprisingly, he's making his film debut. Therefore, I assume he's a rookie in Cannes. Mr. Mark Womack, welcome to the fold. Welcome to Cannes. Uh, the other three are more than members of the Cannes family. They are pillars of the festival. They've been here for coming back forever, and they are welcome to c come back forever. And they are uh, sitting next to me, Rebecca O'Brien, producer, Paul, Paul Laverty, scriptwriter, and of course, the director, Mr. Ken Loach. Uh, the first reaction that one could perceive when one came out of the screening yesterday, Mr. Loach, is that you have not lost your capacity for indignation <laughs> or anger or both Well, um, and more. Yes, I, I mean, I, I think um, the, the, the Iraq war and, and what happened there um, is something that Paul and I and Rebecca wanted to... Uh, yes. Uh, w wanted to deal with for um, a long time, really. Um, and the, the, the question was, was not, uh, should we make one, but, but how? Um, because it was a monstrous uh, crime against the Iraqi people. It was illegal. It has, uh, we have tolerated torture. There's been massive corruption. It was a war fought for greed, naked greed. Um, and the, the challenge was to find a story that would, and a characters that would, um, that would reveal this, uh, a, a conflict, a, a, a knot that you could unravel and that would indicate all the different, the, the, the landscape of what had happened in, in that war. Um, then Paul wrote uh, the character of Fergus, uh, the contractor, and his friend uh, Frankie who died, and through uncovering that story of Frankie's death, we, we hoped to tap into all the different elements in, that, uh, in this terrible crime, because it is a crime. Um, but to try to do it, it, because history is lived through people's lives, it's through people's experiences. So it was trying to explore those experiences that we hoped would reveal the horror of the war. Now, who came up with the idea in the first place? Um, uh, and who decided that it, the time was right now to tell it? I, I think it was, uh, it emerged like, you know, through smoke through the chimney, really. Um, but it was Paul's, Paul's uh, idea of Fergus that was the kick started it. That Paul, had you met anyone who had been, who had served as a model for Fergus, or that triggered this whole process, or um, what? Well, I mean, there's many things that triggered the whole process. I mean, I could think back to the 24th of March, 2003, when on the front page of a photograph in El Mundo, there was a tiny little girl pulled from the, pulled from the rubble by her grand, grandfather, it seemed, and her legs were shredded and she was dying. And it's very difficult to get your head around a million people who have been killed. But when you see a photograph like that, you begin to realise that war actually is the indiscriminate mass murder of mostly civilians. And um, so I think... You know, obviously seeing that and the massive corporate greed involved in this, the illegal war, that was something that was just a conversation among us. But as Ken said, you have to find, you have to tell a story. Indignation is not enough for a film. You have to find a complex character full of contradictions. And then um, I spoke to many, many soldiers um, who, who had been in, in the Iraq war and many more. But what was absolutely fascinating, really, was to discover that war was being privatized, that many of these soldiers had gone on to become contractors. And um, these contractors are not answerable to any parliament. They are answerable to an executive, to shareholders. Then I found out about Order 17, which was absolutely fascinating. Um, it was imposed by the Americans, which said every contractor, will, will, none of them will be subject to Iraqi law. And that was really quite remarkable. And then we heard about all the abuses by the contractors, and no wonder, given the impunity. And then Order 17 worked almost as a metaphor for all the people who started the war, because they're never held responsible or the people who have introduced torture are never responsible.
But right in the heart of this was really, you have to find an individual character. And I had the great fortune to speak to a wonderful old nurse called Norma, who um, worked with many soldiers who had been troubled by what they'd seen and what they'd lived. And she said, she was just about to retire, and she said, many of these men are in mourning for their former selves. And I met a soldier who'd drawn a picture of himself in a previous time, and he said, I want my old self back. And you begin to realize that these men, our boys, come back with a rack in their head. And we had the idea of trying to bring a rack back to the UK. If there are any questions, please raise your hand. A question over <coughs> here. And question over here. Uh, thanks. Hi. Sorry, is this on? Yes, hi. Uh, Neil Smith from the uh, BBC News website. Can I ask uh, uh, Ken about the um, waterboarding scene, which is obviously one of the most graphic and disturbing in the film. Was it that your intention that it should be that way, and uh, that, did you want to really bring mm. the, uh, that uh, home onto uh, sort of uh, British soil to show what, uh, what's go going on in our name? Uh, yes, exactly. Uh, waterboarding is torture, although it was sanctioned by the United States, and Paul will be better on the details of this than I am, but, uh, it, and, and of course condoned by the British government, whatever they say, because it's absurd to pretend they didn't know, um, and that their knowledge shows their consent. Uh, to kind of, it, it breaks every um, agreement, it breaks the Geneva Conventions, it breaks all our understanding of human rights, it, it, it breaks our commitment not to torture. Um, and the people who sanction that torture are still the great and the good, um, lording it around the earth. And P Paul will give more details on that, I'm, I'm sure. Um, doing this scene was, was very interesting because it was, um, as you said, it's the centre of the film. And brilliantly played, if I may say, brilliantly played by Mark and, uh, and by Trevor Williams, is at the back there. And um, we... Um, we, we, we started, we were going to shoot the sequence with a kind of mask over Trevor's face. Um, but once we tried to shoot it, it, the mask didn't work. So he was waterboarded, poor man. And he, he, brave, brave, he bore it stoically. Um, uh, but it's a very important scene because it's not just, it's not just the torture itself. <clears throat> it's, the, it's the psychological battle between the torture and the tortured. Um, because to begin with, the tortured guy tells lies. Then, under pressure of torture, he tells half lies, half truth. And then he tells the truth. But it's not what the torturer wants to hear, so he tells lies. And the torturer takes the lies away from the torturing, which shows you can't... And that is how we understand torture works that even though you torture, you don't get the truth. Um, but it's, um, it, it, it is done in our name. The people who, are, who make it acceptable are still, um, uh, are still there, the Blairs, the Bushes, and the rest. And, and Blair, with this supreme irony, is made ambassador for peace in the Middle East. This man who acknowledges, who, who accepts the torture. Um, and if we, if we can't put them in the dock of, for the law courts, we have to put them in the dock for public opinion because they, they need to be brought to account. Can I just add something to that? Because I think it's a very interesting question and it's very, very important to name names here, I think. Um, because that scene that we saw um, was, was, in fact, brought... It was legalised by a group called the Principles Committee. And in that committee were the great and the good. There was um, Dick Cheney. There was the, the wonderful Colin Powell, who is lauded as a great eminent statesman, Condoleezza Rice, uh, Ashcroft, the Attorney General, and the ex-head um, of the CIA called Tennant. Now, they called this enhanced interrogation techniques. And then they got lawyers like John Wu, Gonzalez, William Haynes, these first-class minds trained in the best university of the United States to undermine the Geneva Convention. And that's what they did. They, and they, they implemented, and they are the intellectual authors of torture. Now, human rights organizations have been totally ignored. And they say there is a case to be answered by these people, because the United States is one of 110 countries which has signed conventions against torture. 
and Obama has a legal obligation for his um, Department of um, Investigations to examine a criminal offence because that is part of the law of the land in the United States and it's part of the law of the land of the international community which they have signed. So they should be in the dock facing a criminal trial. Now it really is appalling when they preach to the rest of the world about respect for human rights when they refuse to carry out their um, obligations under this charter. So it's a great case to be answered. And, um, and in relation to this, we mustn't give up because Obama has refused. Just last month, and I take my heart off to the Argentinians because they have just put one of the major generals who is the, one of the intellectual authors of torture in uh, Argentina during the dirty war in the 80s. And they got me sent to prison 20, for 25 years just last month. And we have to follow that example so that future leaders will not undermine international law. And um, I do really take my hat off to the Argentinians. I can't, I can't imagine, Mr. Womack, that this was an easy scene to shoot, nor for that matter, Mr. Williams. Was it? Uh, no. Um, it, it was, it was uh, very traumatic uh, for, uh, for Trevor more than me, I would imagine. But um, I think we tried, to, we tried to do it. We tried to cheat him um, using a tube, and we found that, um, that it, it, wasn't, it wasn't working that way for us. So that uh, I think um, Trevor... Um, Trevor just went for it and we, and, we, and we did it for real. And I think we had to, we, you know, if you're going to do something like that, you've got to commit to do it truthfully, as truthfully as you possibly can. And, um, and hopefully we did. But it, it was very difficult. How long did the shooting of that scene take? Because uh, the idea of going back home and coming back the following morning no, to it do... It was a day. Oh. It, was it was a full day. Mm -hmm. um, uh, on but it, it, I mean, I think poor Trevor probably took took it. Uh, I mean, I think you know he was still shaken by it for some weeks afterwards because it is a really vile, vile thing to uh, have happened to you. Uh, Henry, sh should we ask Trevor to stand? Yeah, Trevor, yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. stand up. <laughs> yeah. Let them all see yeah. you. Let's see your legs. <laughs> <laughs> and then question here, and then the gentleman over there. Uh, yes, uh, Armin Kuyumjian from Chile. Uh, you referred earlier to the privatization of uh, mm -hmm. the war. Are you aware that, like any private enterprise these days, mm -hmm. they sought afterwards to reduce costs by hiring Latin American yes. so, uh, soldiers who were much, uh, much cheaper? But anyway, that was not my question. My question was in relation with the actors. Uh, I understand that apart from Mark, uh, there are others who did the crossover from uh, television. Uh, and uh, would you say that it's easier to do that in the UK where the quality of television drama is so high and internationally recognized that it doesn't require an upgrade in acting, <laughs> acting talent as it would in other countries where they all look like as if they were in the school play? Thank I think you. they made a really good choice, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, we did, we did. Um, I don't know, you could probably answer that better than me, I suppose. Um, well, it's... Um, the, the, it, it's one profession, Act, acting is, uh, whether you're in the theatre, whether you're in television or in films, it's about finding the truth in the character and the situation and, and making it believable, um, and making it true. And, um, and, and yes, I mean, there is, the, the actors work in, in all, uh, in theatre, television and films in, in our country, naturally. Um, I think television fiction isn't quite as good as you say, sadly, um, it's very, now it's very formulaic. Um, there is very little um, original writing. It's written to a formula, and it's, um, it's not as good as it should be. Um, but uh, it, actors work in all the mediums. Um, your earlier point, I think, is, is also very important. Again, Paul found this in the research, that, uh, as you say, all privatizing is about cutting costs and maximizing profit. Um, and certainly um, people from Latin America were hired because they're cheap. Um, and as to privatization, I mean, this is, this is the spirit of these days, isn't it? I mean, we've privatized industries, we've privatized railways, we've privatized transport, we've tried privatized health care, we've privatized prisons, we privatize uh, schools, uh, we, we privatize everything they can make money out of, they grab. So the logical consequence is 
privatised violence. And of course, it's much cheaper. You don't have to sustain a standing army. You hire a contractor, he dies, end of your responsibility. Uh, a soldier dies, then there's obligations to the family, there's pensions, there's, there's a whole infrastructure has to be maintained. So from the point of view of, of private capital, yeah, get a mercenary, he's cheap. Doesn't matter if he dies. Mm -hmm. But th then there's the added complication to that as well, because in Iraq in particular, there was so much cronyism and so much um, corruption. For example, just during the coalition period, which was a very short period, they reckon, and they're not even sure, that something like $8.8 .8 billion were disappeared or defrauded. And, um, and meanwhile, the devil's always in the detail. Halliburton were charging a soldier $100 to do a laundry bag. Now, that's not cheap and efficient. You know, corporations have made fortunes out of it. The chief executive of Halliburton was making $42 million a year. Uh, so it, it, was, it was incredible how much waste there was within that language of efficiency and transparency. But a great deal of it was a facade. And you also raise another very important point about the hierarchy among the contractors. The ex-SES Special Forces of the United States or Great Britain were receiving, at the height of the war, something like £14,000 a month tax-free. But meanwhile, Peruvians, Colombians, many people from Latin America were on $35 a day, and the Iraqis were on $100 a month. So there was kind of great hierarchy and, um, and prejudice, you know, even within that. Question here, then the gentleman in red. Uh, I'm Karim Kujuk from the Arab Radio and Television, and I have a couple of questions for Mr. Kane Loach, the director, of course, after thanking him for his wonderful movie, just as usual, of course. Sir, uh, do, you, do, you, do you work according to your own preferences, or do you uh, work according to people's taste? And I mean by that, do you simply do whatever you feel like doing, or do you take the the point of how appealing it would be to people into your consideration, that's one thing. And the other thing is, how can you describe the current situation now in Iraq and Afghanistan? And I'm talking about the social situation and the human one. Thank you, sir. Um, well, the, the, the question of what films you, you make um, really is something that uh, Paul and Rebecca and I just um, talk about and knock ideas backwards and forwards. and. Um, so it, it comes out of long, protracted conversations and meetings and odd remarks and gradually a subject emerges. Um, and it's, you make the film you feel you have to make, really. Um, and, and it's difficult to describe more than that. There are all kinds of um, things to, to assess as, you know, in, in, in that. But it, you make the film you feel you, you, you have to make. Um, I'm not really, I haven't done enough recent research to, to comment in detail on the situation in, in Iraq and Afghanistan, but from the Iraqis, I've no first-hand connection to Afghanistan. The, the connection we had to Iraq was through the Iraqis we met in Jordan. And from their point of view, what they told us was that, of course, it continues to get worse. And the, um, the violence which has been unleashed by the war is just endless. <clears throat> endless and vengeance seeks vengeance and so on. Uh, we had, we could sit here all day and, and exchange stories about um, the tragedies that the Iraqi families suffered, um, uh, of the slaughter of, uh, th that is just, is just stunning. Um, and I, I can't even enter it. I mean, the question, I guess the question is in Iraq that anyone can see is that the US will not allow an independent state to develop. There will always be a measure of control. And it's just the question is, how long is the piece of string that they allow for the Iraqi to be nominally independent? Sir, and the lady here, and the lady there. Hello. Uh, this is Joseph Opraimakis, Movies for the Masses from Greece. Uh, question for Mr. Loach and Mr. Womack. Um, when one goes in to watch uh, a film about Iraq, he expects a certain amount of um, visceral tension on the screen. Yet in your film, the, the tension is very much uh, psychological or subconscious, so to speak. So uh, I'd like you both to, to expand a little on how you approached that matter of your film, that theme of your film. Um, well, the, the, um, the, the, the tension is, is in the is in the script. I mean, it's in the disintegration of uh, Fergus as a character. And it's in uh, f trying to 
discover the uh, the reality behind Frankie's death. It, it, and uh, one revelation leads you one way, another revelation leads you another way. Um, but we we didn't try to make a thriller. Um, so I mean, the word thriller has been used. We didn't try to make a thriller. We just tried to tried to tell the story in as, as economically and as and with as much clarity as we could, while paying respect to its complexity, really. But, it, but the, 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 so the tension is twofold. It, it's what happened to Frankie, but it's in how is Fergus disintegrating? How is he, how is he falling apart? And, and there's, I mean, Mark may say something about how, um, as, as an actor, he, he achieved that. I think, uh, I think I tried to, with the help of Ken and Paul and everyone, I think I tried to keep the, the tension more contained and less, uh, less kind of overt in a way. Uh, I think it, it, was, uh, it was about finding the complexity of this character. And uh, I think for me, uh, to, to contain that, later, when, later on in the story when the character begins to unravel, I think that that's when, you know, you can see, uh, you can see that tension kind of gets tighter and begins to, to become more uh, overt. And you can see that he's going to explode at any time. I tried to keep that contained. So uh, I think basically, um, fundamentally, you know, you try to keep it truthful and real. Ma'am, and then the lady there. Yes, ma'am. <coughs> Go ahead. Um, hello, it's Anita Singh from the Daily Telegraph. Mm -hmm. right. Hi. Um, it's a question for Mr. Loach. Could you talk a little bit about how you came to cast Craig Lumberg? And what was it like working with him? Because it's an incredibly natural performance for someone who's never acted before. Um, well, Paul should start this, because mm. Paul, Paul met him originally. Mm -hmm. um, well, before obviously starting the story, I spent a lot of time speaking to ex-soldiers and contractors, and uh, just by total coincidence, three times that one week, I met soldiers who were, who were blinded, um, and Craig uh, made a great impression on me. Sitting in his kitchen there, you could see the, the war actually marked on his face. You see this young lad who's been blinded for life, but he had such spirit and spark about him that he really... One thing he said to me, he says, I may be blind, but blindness ain't got me. And he goes, I was a leader of men when I had sight, and I will still be a leader. And there was something so remarkable about this boy that he, he really touched me, I suppose. And um, I remember telling Ken and, and Rebecca, i just come across Craig. The other two boys were terrific as well, but there was just something very special about Craig. There was such vitality. And, and in a strange way, too, um, in my imagination, that um, we had Fergus, who had made a lot of money, his big flat by the Mersey, he couldn't face that kind of antiseptic, big, cold space, and he wanted to be on the sofa of his mate, to be around soldiers who understood him, didn't have to express anything. And um, so that kind of fitted in, in, in with the, the story too. And um, so um, Ken did some improvisations with Craig, and you can take it from there. Yeah, yeah yes, yeah. and um, yeah. he, he, was, uh, mm. he, he responded in a very mm. uh, genuine, spontaneous way. Um, and... Uh, the, 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 the character the, uh, the, the, that you see in the film, I think, is very true to Craig. I mean, a remarkable man. I mean, he, he uh, mm -hmm. in the breaks in filming that he had, mm -hmm. he went and played blind football for England in Greece, and he climbed Mount Kilimanjaro. <laughs> and, and this is just, you know, between breaks in filming, so God knows what he's doing now. He let me fly a plane. He did everything, that boy. He was unbelievable. He is an extraordinary guy, yeah, and a, yeah. a really, yeah. a really... I mean, there's not many people you can say it about, but a really heroic mm -hmm. young man. Terrific guy. And what was also interesting for the story as well, and I think this... I hope this works, but um, in many ways, he was more whole than the character of Fergus was. He'd been massively physically damaged. But in a strange way, you know, the character that Craig played, and he as a person, I mean, he really was a vastly powerful, you know, impressive character. And, um, and then there are exceptional, you know, characters like that. But there are many, many others who I met who've been actually crushed by their experiences. And in a strange way, we see Fergus physically whole, but absolutely mentally, massively unstable. And can I just say one thing I think is very, very important too? I spent a lot of time with a wonderful charity called Combat Stress. I spent a week with them. I don't know how many soldiers I met during that time. Uh, but they told me that, on average, it took between 14 and 17 years for the post-traumatic stress uh, 
to manifest itself. And so in the future, they were expecting vast numbers of uh, really destroyed people. You know, something like 10% of the, the, the population, the prison population in the United Kingdom now is, is ex-soldiers. Many, many of the homeless are ex-soldiers. And also in the United States, I heard the Surgeon General, one of the senior figures in the, in the American Army, saying they don't know, but there could be up to 500,000 people who will suffer from this in the future. So can you imagine that multiplied by their families, their partners, their children, and their communities? So, I mean, this war will really go on. To, I mean, the, the Iraqis suffer more than anyone, but in our own communities, too, we will face the consequences for this long past um, the time when Bush and Blair have received their millions from their books. Ma'am, then the gentleman. Hoda Ibrahim, Agence France Presse, Moyen-Orient. Justement, ma question. Agence France Presse, Middle East. My question goes along the same lines. Ken Loach and uh, Mr. Laverty, does your film fit in with this vision, the vision which uh, reveals that uh, our children are being killed in Iraq as in other countries and we shan't emerge unscathed from this war? That's my first question. And my second question, just one thing at a time, please. So, do they emerge unscathed from this war? Um, well, I, I think Paul's just answered that, really. Uh, of course not. Um, and uh, the, the, the scars Paul talked about, and I, I don't take the time by repeating what he said, um, but I, I think we do have to remember that the, the prime victims are the Iraqis. They're the ones who have suffered. And if I can be a little bit contentious, it does disturb me a little when we see maybe films from America that see the main victims as American soldiers. <clears throat> and it disturbs me even more when films like that are then dedicated to the American military. Because sure, they've suffered, but just think of the millions of Iraqis that are dead, the families destroyed, children mutilated, homes smashed, families, four million people in exile, so in that context, I find it very disturbing that films about this war are dedicated to the American military. Can I just add one thing to that I think is very, very interesting as well? It's just how they try to rewrite the history, how we try to forget. I mean, it was memorable, just connected with what Ken said there, was when um, uh, Gordon Brown left office. I don't know if you watched that ritual when he left 10 Downing Street. Um, Gordon Brown, who of course was part of the, the cabinet, the war cabinet, that um, approved that war. And it was incredible, you know, he said, we, I've tried my best over these years to democratize Britain, to make it more green, um, and various other things. And he said, I also want to remember, you know, our soldiers who have died. Now, it was absolutely remarkable, given the reports by organizations like the Lancet, who have estimated that perhaps up to a million Iraqi civilians have been killed. No mention of them, they did not matter. And to see someone who, was once a member of the once proud Labour Party, you know, turned to that and to rewrite history in such a lachrymose fashion, I found it absolutely, totally obscene. Et votre deuxième partie. The second part of your question. The film that uh, won an Oscar this year was Heart Locker. It's really uh, terrible for the victims in Iraq. And that's a moral problem for journalists like myself. Yes, I quite agree with you. My question goes now to the producer. Do you think you share Ken Loach's commitment? Do you have this uh, complicity with him? We see you year by year here in Cannes. Do you have the same degree of commitment as Ken? Or is it simply a question of friendship and professional complicity between you? Uh, total complicity. <laughs> <laughs> Otherwise, I wouldn't be with these guys. I mean, you know, you, you have to sort of uh, dedicate yourself to, to, to the issues. And, I, you know, I believe the stories that we uh, research and, I, you know, want, want to be part of telling the same stories. And uh, so, yeah, complicity. Monsieur. <laughs> Hi, Chris Knight, National Post and Can West News Service, Toronto. Uh, question for Mr. Loach. I was curious in the film, the notion of um, compensation for the families of uh, Iraqi <coughs> civilians who are killed. Did you do any research into specific instances of that? And what is the price that people put on such a thing? I need to 
No, in, the, in the course of my uh, investigation and talking to some ex-soldiers and contractors, I heard a story of some contractors who had got some money together for some people who were injured and they whipped round. Because, I mean, I think it's very important to remember the complexity here. I met actually um, some wonderful contractors, if, you, if I can say that, in the sense that they were proud of their soldiering and they were proud of their profession and they considered themselves private soldiers. You know, many of them are, he came from a working class background and he was very proud to be a, a well-trained soldier. And, um, and I've absolutely no doubt, if I was a journalist in Iraq, I would want this man by me. He was an honourable man. And I met several people like that. But they also told me that they knew of personal knowledge of many, many cowboys out there. Who um, I spoke to one who actually said, killing an Iraqi is like killing a Kafir. He was a South African guard. So there's a whole range of people out there. So I don't want to stereotype every single contractor out there as, as some sort of money-grabbing demon. And, um, and you think many of them come from working class background, they've been soldiers where they've received a pittance. When you consider how many hours they work a day, it's less than the minimum wage. And they saw that money out there and the millions of dollars. It's understandable a young guy would say, well, I want my share, it's my chance to load up, I might never get it again. So um, I actually heard that from a contractor who they, they lumped some money together and they gave it to some victims. But I think that was by far an exception because I heard from many other contractors. And also, if you look at the literature, you will see that many, many people were shot in a, and nobody knows who did it or why they did it. And they denied it you know, when they were accused of it. And to my knowledge, no contractor has ever been prosecuted, not only in Iraq, but elsewhere, which I think gives you an idea of the impunity. In that, in, in, that, in, 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 in that world of private contracting. The lady here, <coughs> then the gentleman here, then the gentleman here. Go ahead. My name is Madeleine Most, um, the Foreign Press Association in Paris, although German uh, magazine, and I'm British as well. Um, I wanted to piggyback my question on to what our Iranian journalist colleague asked yesterday to the filmmakers of Fair Game, because you are much more informed and I think you're better placed to maybe ask, answer that question about do you feel, how do you feel about this possible buildup to war in Iran? And having made a film like this, even if it wins the Palme d'Or after uh, win the, the, the Barley, it didn't find a, a screen in England. So even if you make such a film that that everyone learns and how is is it frustrating when we could have the same thing happen again in Iran? <clears throat> how, how, what is your opinion about that? Um, well, in, in the end, a film is just a film. Um, I mean, what it, it can suggest another point of view. It can suggest uh, a different perspective. It can try and uh, convince you of its uh, truthfulness. But in the end, it's not a political movement. You know, it, it's only a film. And when you leave the cinema, what you do with that information or what you do with that different point of view is up to you. Uh, and, and I think our view would be that um, things only change when politics changes. And that means not swapping one right-wing party for another. It means a real shift in the balance of class forces, to be old-fashioned about it. Um, so I think that that's when change will, will happen. But the, the prospect of war in Iran is... I, I, I don't know. I, I can't estimate that. I, 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 I wouldn't. Um, I'm not sufficiently informed to do it. Um, but clearly, it's a danger. Uh, it, it's how the American um, ruling class judges its interests. That's what we're bound to. Can I just say? I think it's a very, very interesting, interesting question. I mean, it is remarkable to be in this position again. Really, I remember when I worked in Nicaragua and Central America. Many of the intellectual authors of that war another illegal war um, following the Sandinista, Sandinista Revolution in 1979, and I lived there for three years. Many of those people who planned that war, Richard Perrell, the neocons around George Bush Sr., these are the same people, many of them, who planned this war. They did it again. Um, now, can I just quote this wonderful character that both Ken and myself got to know over the years, a guy called Howard Sin. He was a wonderful historian. He died just two months ago, um, 87 years of age. He was actually a bomber pilot during the Second World War, and he said something that was remarkably profound. You know, he'd actually bombed um, France and, and Germany, and he thinks he was responsible for many civilians. And as an older man, he became an historian, 
and he became a radical historian and wrote this wonderful book called The People's History of the United States. But he said, you know, the, the thing about war is the ends, you know, you never know what's going to happen. Totally can be unintended. And this particular war is an example of that. You know, Iran is now stronger. Al-Qaeda are back in the streets of, uh, are, are, are in um, Iraq where they never were before. Our streets in the United States and in Britain are more dangerous. So even from the neocon right-wing perspective, this has been such a dumb, stupid war because they haven't achieved anything. Now, if they do the same, and he also said, but the means of war are absolutely certain. That will be the mass destruction of hundreds of thousands of innocent civilians. That is certain, and this is what's happened. And my great fear is that they do it again. And if they do it again with Iran, what will happen? They will support Hezbollah in, in Lebanon. They'll probably have to cut off supplies with Syria. Um, they will certainly affect Afghanistan. And there could be a whole crescent of totally unintended consequences could end up in even a bigger disaster. And I don't put it beyond these murderers and war criminals to try and do it again. So I think we really, really have to stop these princes of in power behaving like some medieval barons and saying they can start a war again. I am really, really worried about it and I think we have to watch them like hawks because they lie through their teeth and they manipulate and they try and frighten. And pe ordinary people don't war, but they want to promote war. And I'm very scared that these neocons do it again because I've seen them doing it twice. Sir, then sir. Rory Mulholland from Agence France Press. Uh, I don't know if you saw Doug Lyman's film yesterday, Fair Game. But Lyman says that he's the, the first foreign uh, Western director to have actually filled at least part of his film in Iraq itself. He apparently went there for 24 hours and under armed guard did a bit of filming. Did you at any point consider filming in Baghdad? Um, th there, was, there was no real point really. Um, I mean, the, 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 the point was to recreate certain scenes from, from um, from the war from, from Baghdad, the uh, Jordan is very close. It's, I, I think you'd be hard put, well, you wouldn't tell the difference architecturally or in any other way. The Iraqis, the people in the film, our film are Iraqis because there are hundreds of thousands of Iraqis in, in, in Jordan. So it, it would have been a needless um, adventure. And, uh, you know, you always try to do it in the most economical, the most the simplest, the, mo the most, uh, the way that is the most efficient. So there, w there wasn't really a point. Sir, then the lady there. I'm Ben Hoyle from the Times newspaper in London. Um, it, it's getting harder and harder for films, the kind of films that show here to um, get long runs in cinemas and uh, you know, you know, make a lot of money in, on, on the, on the theatre circuit. <laughs> but at the same time, technology is, is making it easier and sort of more available to, to nimbly make the kind of film that you've just made. I just wonder if you could say a bit about your sort of thoughts, the, the, the outlook for this kind of cinema, for art house. Um, cinema, for want of a better word. I think, I mean, what, what, I've dis what we've discovered, um, recently we uh, opened our own channel on YouTube and we rather boldly started uh, putting all of our, trying to make all of our films available for free initially and uh, with advertising and then later it'll become a pay-per-view channel. And we, we've been so fed up with our films being sort of kept secret um, and, and just sort of let out bit by bit by the uh, the rights owners. We we own very few rights ourselves, so we sort of thought we should uh, take hold of those rights and um, and uh, put them make them available. And we have discovered when we did that uh, a few weeks ago, uh, we took down hundreds and hundreds of pirate versions of our own films. So it wasn't like the uh, internet was being policed by anybody on our behalf. Um, so we felt that if we could, could take down the pirated versions of our films and have a formal channel that was um, our own films, we thought that this would be a, a good way forward. And we've discovered since we've done that, we have a huge audience, an untapped audience um, of people who really are interested in the work that we do, much wider than I'd ever anticipated. And uh, I, I'm, I've just uh, yesterday... Uh, put down a challenge to uh, some of the rights holders to uh, come and join us in this venture. Uh, we've made the first step, and, and I think this is a way forward. We want our films to be available to people. We don't want them to be secret. And, uh, and there, is, there are people really interested, and so that's why we've 
gone ahead with this particular venture. And, and just one other thing on that. I think, obviously, support what Rebecca says, but um, I think on, on, a, on a broader scale, we, we shouldn't accept the situation permanently that our cinema screens are closed off to not only to independent British films, but to world cinema. And uh, there's such a narrow range of films as shown in the popular screens on the, in the multiplexes um, that we shouldn't accept it. And, and uh, I'd make a, a sort of daft, a rash proposal, really, M maybe. Suppose we, the ownership of cinemas was like the ownership of theatres, which was owned by the municipality, um, and maybe programmed by people who care about films rather than the people who care about fast food. You know, that, that would be really really uh, a good change and it would mean then we'd have a diversity of mm. films available for the ordinary film goer because if you live outside london in our country you don't see you don't see any of the films that are at this festival mm. hardly any you might see robin hood many times <coughs> but, but the others you won't see so i think i think we really need to, we don't let's mm. just accept mm. that we can use the new technology to get round an unacceptable fact which is the the screens don't belong to us anymore. Can I just give you one example of that as well in, in, in Spain? I remember when remember we were there, we opened Looking for Eric um, just a, a couple of months ago. Uh, and there's 1,200 screens in Spain. And on that same opening weekend, two Hollywood blockbusters took up 600 screens. And that was just those two opening that same week, not to say any other ones. So, I mean, you know, they talk about free market, we'd say, let's give people a choice, give them a real choice, so they get a chance to see other films. But when it was absolutely, you know, um, taken up by these big blockbusters, there was no actually space for other Spanish films, never mind world cinema. Question there, then the lady here. Mm. Yeah, hello, thank you very much for your moving. I very like Ken Loach movies all the time, but I have uh, questions not serious as all. For Mr. Ken Loach, a Mark woman. Um, Mr. Ken Loach, last movies uh, you're shooting about uh, men's stories, but why you are not shooting about women's stories? And uh, second question to Mark woman. Why don't uh, you play a woman? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> have you seen his legs? <laughs> <laughs> Sorry, go ahead. Uh, you, Mark, you are the best actor, and Mr. Ken Loach, you choose a very good uh, actor's team with men. And Mark, uh, for what you had in, uh, for what you love in your heroes? My heroes? Yeah. Ken Loach. Yeah, no. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, I don't know. Uh, acting heroes? Oh, I don't know, I can't answer that. Um, 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 I, I guess I like, I probably have got some directors I like, Shane Meadows, um, Mike Lee, people like that. Acting heroes, I'm, I don't know, I can't think of it. Um, well, we, we've done quite a few films about women. <laughs> um, it's a free world. Uh, yes, it's a free world. It was, it was about most a, recent one. Uh, a, a woman who... Um, runs an agency for foreign workers. Um, very complex character, really. Um, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I take your point in general. M may maybe next one. Mm -hmm. But there is a woman in this film, Andrea Lowe, who, yes. who I think puts in a terrific performance, and it's very sad that she's not here. Um, she wasn't made available by the TV people that are filming a pilot with her at the moment. And we're really, really sad that she's not here because we think she, she's put in a fantastic performance. And she's a really important supporting character. And um, her work absolutely amplifies Fergus's situation in the film. Yeah, d just to add to what Rebecca said, I mean, you know, just occasionally in our business, you meet people of a small mind, and it's such a pity she wasn't allowed to come. It would have been a fantastic day for her. She's a, an actress who's worked really hard all her for a long professional life, and to be denied this moment is really sad. So we're, we're very sorry she's not here. Ma'am? Uh, yes? Thank you for the movie. I uh, just wanted to ask you, do you think that Iraqi war affected the election? and the defeat of the Labour Party. And do you think that the new government will be another or different attitude towards the foreign politics, towards the other countries? 
Well, let's turn that into a film question. <laughs> yeah. Um, well, um, I think it contributed to the defeat of Labour in the sense that people uh, became very cynical about their honesty. Uh, there was a huge revulsion against the war, and um, and of course that revulsion attached to the, the party in power, which was Labour. Um, will Cameron be any different? Well, with with the election. In, in Britain, we, we now have the traditional face of the ruling class in Britain back. Uh, wealthy, white men, privileged background, privately educated, beautiful manners, fine tailoring, urbane sense of humor, <laughs> ruthless. <laughs> they have you by the shorts. <laughs> and they, they will be as ruthless as they need to be. And don't be fooled by the gentlemanly exterior. They will, uh, they will savage you, as they are about to savage the working people in Britain. Um, look for a rise in unemployment, a rise in poverty, um, decrease in health services, and so on. Um, I think, I think they'll be a very astute politicians. If they can avoid war, they will do, because it's bad for business. But if they need to, then, then they will. I, I don't think the any humanitarian principles will be involved. I think it will be uh, a strategic decision on behalf of their class. On that cheerful note, I'm afraid <laughs> our time is up. Thank you very much, all of you, for being here. OK, thanks a lot. <laughs>